آروم آروم شوله بجان فکن آروم آروم مهرت همچون کمن برگردنم حلق زد آتش به جان و دل زد تموم شده صبر من دستم بگیر جان من در اسرت روی تو آ از تمنای تو عمرم به سر شد ببین پرده ز رویت مردم از هجرت از غم رویت سوخت ببین عاشق تو از فراغ تو مردم از هجرت از غم رویت سوخت ببین عاشق تو از فراغ 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 تو mankind affects the entire material world and can change and determine its form if this result is negative its response from the material world is negative for all. This negative response that results from the overall offenses of human society puts all living beings in an unpleasant condition and represents divine retribution. In addition, the evolution of civilizations in human societies has caused an increasing tendency toward imposing forms of order that increase human conflict with the natural world. This desire for extreme order causes a rebellion of the subconscious part of the human mind against order. This rebellion in turn causes increasing social disorder such as vandalism and robbery and personal inclinations towards sadistic and masochistic behavior. T in other words, disregarding natural laws such as the universe's law of order and disorder one creates problems that can also be considered divine retribution. Any disturbance caused by type A non-organic beings on the basis of their role in the material world and resulting from humankind's wrongdoing is a form of divine retribution. Among these, the Retribution Keeper's intervention reveals divine retribution. These disturbances may include arousing various kinds of compulsive and obsessive behaviors, hallucinations, paranoia, and multiple personality disorder. They may also cause annoyance by misplacing or loss of a person's belongings. The misplacing of objects can also occur from intervention by captivation keepers or by any type A non-organic being who imitates humankind in using physical objects. These beings can also possess a person's mind and cause an individual to move an object to an unlikely and inappropriate location from which he has difficulty retrieving the object when needed. A sick spell keepers this category of non-organic beings become active for casting spells. They become active in different ways with the involvement of the negative network. The negative network can also directly cast spells that cause damage in the form of negative radiation without the use of. These beings... Spell keepers activate spells that are cast with the help of mental or written codes or formulas. Intentional or unintentional use of the C codes grants these beings the capability of executing them and sets them on a specific mission. These codes may be used in the form of a specific table of number, alphabets, mantras, or images and symbols. Figure I depicts the operation of spells. Figure 2. Operation of spells. For overall prevention of entanglement with any form of spells, Humankind must remain in positive states such as hope, peace, and happiness, and avoid negative states such as fear, sorrow, and anxiety. alt hoff participation in casting spells, with good or bad intentions, is immoral by not taking safety measures. The victim creates the conditions for the spell to be cast, and is thus also responsible for this, Brady. 23. Commit. Therefore, 
the possibility of spells, and the existence of spell. Keepers can be considered a collective test for human society. A one captivation keepers techniques exist for captivating type band this category of type A, non-organic beings. Captivation keepers are tamed and captivated by people who wish to use them and set them on designated missions to which the people assign them. Therefore, they can be called captivation keeper. People can perform such captivation by various methods such as imprisoning their children or threatening to burn or otherwise harm them. People involved in such acts may be attacked by these beings and their families and future generations may even be disturbed by these beings and face serious consequences. People can unintentionally activate spell keepers by using public lie accessible codes, but people can activate captivation keepers only through intentional measure, not necessarily requiring spell. Type A Non-Organic Beings and Religion The role of Type A beings in purgatory from a time-free perspective, all segments of the world of duality are consistently connected to one another. Bearing in mind that they take form from unity to multiplicity, as a whole, they look like a tree. Who, mankind, and all other parts of this tree begin taking form from oneity, and each takes a root to their Lord One. Because purgatory, a segment of the duality cycle, is an experience in a time-free state. By entering this stage of the cycle, humankind and counters this live tree. Le tree is a testimony of our experience, where a person encounters a blazingly clear realization of how he has taken the journey of duality up to that point, as opposed to how he should have taken it. As humankind enters heaven, the next segment of the duality cycle, the role of the tree for humankind is completed. Similarly, all other elements of the tree return to their Lord along a separate road, but parallel to humankind's return to our Lord. A component of this tree is type A non-organic beings that, given their nature of fire, are the 111 naturing factor of humankind in life and a burning element in purgatory. Based on their responsibilities, they can be serious threats to humankind for our wrongdoings. Therefore, they become maturation and growth elements for a person who can immune himself from these threats and free himself from them. Lilevani's external fire elements accompany Hunankind in purgatory. LN this time free state, our offenses are present before us and create in us a strong sense of burning regret. In purgatory, humankind witnesses how universe keeper's role reveals our depravity, desecration of any part of the material world. Direction keeper's task Disclose our negligence of the unity of the Mater Isle world. Wisdom Keeper's responsibility exposed our aberrations, and Trial Keeper's role exposed our preference of pleasure, power, wealth, and fanoni over our faith. The hardship and bitterness of purgatory is permeated by Trial Keeper's seduction and humankind's ignorance. The role of religion in exposing Satan and offering protection from it, humankind's understanding of God, has had an evolving process and has progressed through time. We first sought God in nature and bowed to the sun, phi, or any other phenomenon that we found powerful and worshipped it. We then sought God, our unknown powerful creator, in self-made symbols made of wood, stone, and other materials, and worshipped them. With the emergence of monotheistic religions, these physical symbols became less popular, and humankind turned to an unseen God. Yet, for us, God still had a human form, and until monotheistic prophets changed that figure, we worship this human image of an unseen God. With time, God became an unseeable creator who nonetheless possessed attributes that could describe him. The, essentially, his infinite being is indescribable and unperceivable and has no labels or describable characteristics. The attributes that divine religions ascribe to him only explain the quality of his relationship to the material world. Therefore, acknowledgement of an indescribable and nameless God is the final stage of humankind's evolution of understanding God. L in each phase, alongside our attention to the Creator that is the positive aspect of our curious eye, we also observe the magical powers of nature that are the negative aspect of this curiosity. Thus, the practices of witchcraft as view ye you as the records of humankind's inclination to worship are as old as human history. In addition to our God-seeking nature, humankind has inner capacities for both vice and virtue. Therefore, we observe our world from two different perspectives, Kamal and anti-Kamal. The purpose of religion is to serve humankind. From the beginning of time, religions were not distinguishable as divine or satanic.
Humankind's first creative and spiritual inspirations were the birth of religion. Yet as water is pure and refreshing at the headspring, but may taste different after running for a long distance, with passage of time, religions have become polluted with division, distortion, and deviati on. The essence of religion is pure, but with time it finds positive and negative application. Throughout the process of seeking God, humankind has been invited by prophets, saints, and mystics to a single religion. There is only one manner one that leads to Kamal, and that is the manner of submission and surrender. The CAU for this manner was to help all oh, mankind to recognize where to invest our mental, spiritual, and physical assets. Generally, the purpose of religion was to aid humankind to see our place in the material world, to answer our primary and fundamental questions, to warn us against obstacles and th reads on our path, to show us what to turn toward and what to turn away from. In essence, religion set forth the notion of worship too and refrainment from tagudal. Religion suggests direction and guideline, but each individual interprets it in a different way. As a consequence, followers of religions, with division and denying one another, have left the purpose of religions unfulfilled. The message of each prophet is not separated from the other. Each of them has introduced religion to humankind from a unique outlook and emphasized one of humankind's infinite dimensions and potentials and taught one aspect of divine awareness. To attain divine awareness, we need AU these teachings and cannot cast aside a single message. One important service religions have done for humankind has been creating awareness about avoiding non-organic beings. For instance, in 27, non-organic beings with the use of mental code. The Bible we find ample information and guidelines about exorcism and the healing of manic individuals possessed by non-organic beings. This may be the reason that Quran, the next collection of divine guidelines, only briefly mentions these facts. Religious guidelines ask humankind to avoid following inner and outer Satan. Satan's invitation may be by force, by temptation and suggestion, or in some instances a mere hint. Encountering Satan, inner and outer, is based on a set of laws and principles. Once humankind seeks truth and chooses to fulfill our aspiration, Satan begins to challenge us. When humankind seeks true awareness and understanding of the material world and the essence of creation, it is Satan's responsibility to challenge us. It is here that we seek refuge from Satan and God. It is here to gain awareness of the truth and to attain Kamal. All humankind needs is divine protection from Satan's attacks. Divine religions have repeatedly emphasized this matter. Two non-organic beings, type B, mind bodies, from an interuniversal outlook, Every person has numerous bodies, such as the physical body, astral body, psychological body, and mind body. Among them, there is a body called the collective spirit body shared by all humankind, and because of it, all people have an invisible connection to one another. Therefore, we consider that all people share each other's fall or rise to come out. With a person's death and an end to life in this world, the physical body is separated from the other bodies and begins to decompose break up into its constituent parts, and return to ecosystem. Death also eliminates other human bodies, such as the psychological L and astral bow dies. However, a person's mind body lives on after death. After death, a person is free from emotional processes and reactions. That result from the processing of psychological body software, such as feelings of sadness, pain, and happiness. However, because of a deceased individual's attachments to our experiences and memories during his life in this world stored in the mind-body's memory and data archive, he recreates them in his mind. That lives on and exhibits emotional behavior. Therefore, the effects of data from the psychological body on the mind-body before death are similar to the effects of data that is reread by the surviving mind and become the roots of the individual. Deceased he ons and behavior in his life after death. Death takes place in two stages, physical death followed by absolute death. During physical death stage, a person's astral body is still alive and he can return to life. Absolute death occurs only when the astral body dies. The time difference between physical and absolute death vary from a few minutes to a few days in different people. During this time, any shock to the astral body can revive the physical body. But when the astral body dies, the psychological body also dies and the only part that lives on is the mind-body. 
An individual who lives under the management of his mind-body after his absolute death is called mind-body, a term equivalent to the word soul or spirit, by which most people mean a deceased human being. On the basis of this lexicon, mind-bodies, persons who have experienced absolute death and are now experiencing the next phase, are called non-organic beings type B, and only the guiding soul, similar to A, compass it offers directions to human on his path to Kamal, is called soul. Throughout humankind's journey in the cycle of the world of duality, our guiding soul is in charge of guiding us toward Kamal. For the duration of H.W. Nankind's life in this world, the guiding soul plays this role by creating in us a feeling of having lost something. With this feeling, each person continues searching for his lost component that is not fulfilled by achieving wealth, education, marriage, and the like. In other words, the guiding soul is the reason humankind finds all earthly pleasures empty. Otherwise, humankind would feel satisfied and happy with the fulfillment of our material desires and would no jayonger seek Kamal. Unlike earthly pleasures, satisfaction of Kamal has no end and is constantly desired. Mind, body, and attachment to life in this world. With an individual's absolute death, when his mind body is about to break away, all that occurred in his life flashes before him in an instant with accurate details, and his attachments in life surface and catches attention. Thus, when mind-body detaches from other elements, it experiences two pulling forces. One is the guiding soul that invites the mind-body to go forward and move to the next phase, and the other is the mind-body's, positive or negative, ties to life that pull him back and engage him in life in this world. The mind-body's attachments can be to children, spouse, belongings, wealth, power, fanone, and the like. Many mind-bodies may have strong bonds with this world to the extent that they cannot accept their death for a long time and even imagine a body for themselves. The experience of death is very sweet for everyone. Even the most horrifying death is not difficult and painful for the person who is experiencing it. That moment is in fact very pleasant. It is the mental attachments to this life and this world that determine the difficulties of death. If one experiences pain and suffering, it results from the individual's ties pulling him back to continue life in this world and his unfamiliarity with the next phase of the journey. Only people who attain knowledge of Kamal during their life in this world and enjoy a level of awareness about humankind's return to our Lord welcome death with open arms. After death, uncaring about this life, they move to the next stage of their journey and toward their Lord. In contrast, people who commit suicide remain imprisoned by this world longer than others. Developing strong bonds is directly related to the alignment of a person's life purpose. Anything that becomes a person's purpose, other than Kamal, becomes an attachment factor. Even means of achieving Kamal, such as science, religion, spirituality, or mysticism, can become a person's distraction if not identified as means for the journey to Kamal. For instance, if a person is particular about late-night prayers and is involved with that action to the extent that he neglects the quality of that prayer, the means becomes the goal and thus a distraction. Many people are strongly attached to certain actions, negative or positive, to certain people and locations, or even to collections of their favorite objects. When death occurs and all of life's events and experiences are reviewed in the dying person's mind in a split second, these attachments are highlighted. The mind-body will tend to return to those ties and live as if death has not occurred. If family is the strongest attachment, the deceased individual will try to live with them as if he were still alive. He will even try to communicate with them and show them that he is still alive and wishes to continue living with them as before. The family or friends sometimes feel a presence, and often this attachment results in the deceased person's mind-body possessing the minds of the family members. Certain people perform the immoral act of communicating with mind-body. A study of these communications reveals several points worth discussing. If a mind-body is present when called, it demonstrates its continuing ties to this life its desire to make its presence known, and its hesitation to move forward. Some of these mind-bodies are constantly present and may even introduce themselves as someone else who has been summoned by these communications. They are commonly called wandering souls. These mind-bodies who refuse to move forward from limbo seek any opportunity to make their presence known. They can possess the mind of a living individual. They usually look for someone who has similar inclinations or attachments so that they can experience this world through the window of that person's mind. However, 
If a mind body has achieved knowledge of Kamal, it will not miss the opportunity to move forward to the next phase of the journey to perfection. As a result, elevated mind bodies cannot be summoned or contacted, and people who claim to be in contact with the saints or uplifted souls are in fact being deceived by other non-organic beings. Mind bodies are keen to correspond and report their present state because of their strong ties to a person or an entity. These reports are based on the mind body's imagination formed by these attachments and can occur in reality or in a dream. For instance, the mind body of a priest, due to strong devotion to his job, may constantly imagine himself holding his holy book, going to the church, and performing the religious rituals just as he did before death. If the person witnessing the report is not aware of the drastic changes in the conditions of life after death, he may believe that the deceased priest is giving accurate information about his new environment. Whereas the priest is actual lie imprisoned by his attachments to his life before death and cannot move forward. Some mind bodies describe themselves as happy in a beautiful garden. Many of people who hear such stories believe that this person has found his way to heaven, although, in fact, the mind body is in that state only in its imagination and in response to its mental attachment. Such a description could be due to its love for nature, expectation of going to heaven, or the long-lost dream of living in a garden that was not fulfilled during life before death. In any case, humankind's attachments not only affect the quality of our UFE in this world, but they can also restrain us from experiencing what is essential in our path to Kamal. Why death was designed in the plan of creation in the cycle of the world of duality. While people can achieve all levels of Kamal with our free will and ability to choose, experiencing each stage of this cycle causes a different kind of Kamal for us that is beyond our free will and is based on the plan of creation. This form of Kamal achieved as a result of the reduction of humankind's existential dimensions is a journey from neediness to absolute needlessness through the phenomenon called death. Reaching the state of needlessness may seem possible in the stage of living in this world. But we must realize that we can achieve only a certain level of it in this world because humankind has many existential elements and dimensions. Such components are essential to sustain life in this world, but we leave them behind with death. These elements entail certain needs. Therefore, we cannot achieve needlessness in this stage of duality. For instance, a newborn is at his highest point of neediness and cannot live without his parents' care. But as the baby grows older, new needs replace those of infancy. Now the question becomes, even if this person lives for L0000 years, will he ever reach needlessness? It is important to consider that even someone with an ascetic lifestyle still requires a minimal amount of food to live. Thus, an eternal life in this world is equivalent to eternal neediness and denies Kamal the journey from neediness to absolute needlessness. Therefore, God has blessed humankind with death in our path so that shifting to the next state reduces our neediness. In other words, the basis of death is divine love, and it guarantees that humankind returns to God. In addition, death enables people to experience a different form of journey to Kamal without having to attend to our physical needs. If death were a matter of choice, not only would most people not have chosen to leave this world, but most of us would also have spent our entire lives attending to our physical needs and ignored Kamal. Humankind constantly experiences two inviting forces. One is an upward pulling force, Kamal, and the other is a downward pulling force, anti Kamal. In this life, worldly possessions and humankind's pride, self importance, constitute the anti Kamal force that distracts and engages us with worldly affair. The feeling of being lost or having lost something that is not fulfilled by earthly pleasures invites us in the direction of seeking Kamal. These forces exist after death in a different form. The anti Kamal force is humankind's attachments to life before death that stops us from shifting to the next state, space free world, and the Kamal force is the guiding soul that invites us to move forward to that next world. The intensity of humankind's attachments defines our suspense in limbo after death. By overcoming the anti Kamal force, humankind can move forward to a new birth in the new world one. Chapter 2 Symptoms and Disorders Caused by Non Organic Beings Non-organic beings can take over a person's commanding unity, mind, so as to gain control and influence over him. They consume people's vital energy by taking hold of our chakras and energy channels and act as parasites. By violating a person's mind, these beings can interfere in memory management and data, arranging management urtits, 
and, in an obvious or subliminal manner, project their intended thoughts and feelings onto him. Non-organic beings also intervene in the mind's body and cell management unit tasks, causing illness and disorder. Therefore, these beings can also be called non-organic viruses. 1. Disorders caused by non-organic beings. We can categorize disorders caused by the possession of a person's ep and by non-organic beings as follows. Mental disorders, sensory hallucinations, visual, auditory, olfactory, somatic sensations. The individual hears sound, sees objects or people that others do not notice, or has false feelings of, for example, being rejected by other, or being constantly followed. L. Imposed hallucinations. Imposed thoughts or mentation from non-organic viruses that result in development of unreal beliefs and assumptions or commands for unusual behavior displayed in a cons shi. State with no logical or emotional justification by the individual. Multiple personality disorder. The presence of two or more personalities in an individual. Bipolar disorder, a condition in which a person rapidly goes back and forth between very good mood and depression. Obsessive compulsive behavior, a condition in which an individual has unwanted and repeated thoughts, idea, feelings, or behaviors that drive him to do something. Irrational fears or phobia, a persistent fear of an object or a situation. The individual suffering from phobia goes to great lengths to avoid the subject of this fear. Hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, a condition with overactivity, impulsiveness, inattentiveness, or a combination, unusual inclinations, unusual emotions, the urge to commit suicide, and causing harm to the self or others' unusual behaviors, sleepwalking, psychological disorders, depression, anxiety, agitation, sense of guilt, and the like. Physical disorders, incurable diseases, genetic disorders, and the like. Physical, mental, psychological disorders, sleep quality disorders, and the like. Disorders with unknown causes, unexplained random bruises, swelling, wounds, scratches on the body, sleepwalking, where the individual is guided around barriers or objects with closed eyes. Sleep, talking, and screaming. Bruxism, movement of pain over the body, sleep paralysis, and the like. Non-organic beings in the first instance have their most destructive E effects on the mind and subsequently on the psyche, and finally on the physical body. Currently, neither modern medicine nor complementary medicine have any fundamental and definite treatments for the disorders and discomforts caused by these viruses. The common methods of treatment for these disorders are mainly to relieve the symptoms, thus masking but not resolving the problem, because we lack knowledge about the key factors causing the symptoms and the means of removing them. 2. Signs of infection by non-organic beings the aforementioned mental, psychological, and physical disorders describe only a fraction of various signs and symptoms of infection by non-organic beings. Other signs that indicate such infection include unusual inclinations and behavior, telepathy, reports of experiences in the state of hypnosis that are often used in support of the theory of reincarnation, abuse, and taking advantage of non-organic beings. Unusual inclinations and behavior type B non-organic beings have strong effects on a person's life that include causing unusual inclinations and behavior. Although type A can motivate these inclinations and behavior, type B can more affect, tively cause people to manifest them. Generally, an individual's sudden and non-discretionary change of inclinations and behavior to inclinations and manners of a recently deceased relative, usually nearly immediately after the relative's death, indicates the deceased. D. Relative's intervention in the individual's M.A. management system, mine. For instance, after a father's death, the son noticeably exhibits one of the father's characteristics or habit. This behavior occurs because the deceased parent's mind-body, due to his attachments and need for mental satisfaction, possesses the mind of his son and thus, willingly or unwillingly, transfers his characteristics, inclination, and illnesses to the host body. Type B's reasons for choosing an individual vary. Being a family member, a friend, or a loved one is not required for this selection. In addition to the deceased person's feelings of love or hatred as a motive for possessing an individual, other factors can motivate this selection. Type B may choose a host with a specific similarity, such as a common interest or trait. Their choice might be based on their needs and what they lacked in life before death. They may target individuals capable of achieving their unfulfilled goals, Andriano second. To find someone with these qualities, they look beyond their friends and relatives. 
Some type B viruses, without no consideration or hesitation, simply take their first opportunity of pauses psyop, with no preference for a specific person or characteristic. In most such scenarios, the new inclination, characteristic, or trait that the possessed individual displays appears unusual to him and those around him. Telepathy. A strong emotional bond between individuals results in connections between their mind bodies that open the door for transfer of non-organic beings from one person to another. This allows movement of the viruses from one person to the next. Thus, the virus is active between two or more individuals and is called a shared virus. Generally, Individuals with shared viruses sense each other's feelings and thoughts with no external or physical interactions. This state is commonly called telepathy. Telepathy often occurs between identical twins because they share a strong emotional bond. Further, because transfer of non-organic beings is equal during their mother's pregnancy, they are infected by shared viruses that persist after birth. Two individuals sharing love provides an opportunity for development of shared viruses. In the path of love, the lover and the beloved attain unity to develop true empathy. For humankind to develop abuarinus about the existence of an intelligent bond between people and an intelligent bond among all elements of the universe, the experience of love is very valuable. Although this experience is undeniably essential on our path to Kama, it can provide a means for viruses to transfer from one or both parties to the other and cause telepathic ability. Note that strong mental and emotional attention only creates an opportunity for the transfer of viruses. When neither party feels an urge to gain information about the other party's mental state, emotional state, or incidents surrounding him, non-organic viral transfer does not occur. However, other means of transmitting shared non-organic viruses include genetic transfer and non-organic beings casting spells that involve two or more individuals. When a non-organic virus is shared between at least two individuals, one party's attempt to evict the virus can, given distance and unawareness of such act, provoke the virus's reaction against eviction in the second person. In some experiences, successful elimination in one individual terminated all telepathic ability, i.e. In SWN, telepathy can result when non-organic viruses exploit SPEC mental or emotional attention between people and so it reveals infection by these viruses. Reports given in the state of hypnosis. The theory of reincarnation is thousands of years old, and billions of people believe in it. According to this belief, humankind is reborn into this world, in a new body after our biological death. Different schools of thought have diverse ideas about the process of reincarnation. This rebirth can be in human, animal, plant, or solid form. Based on this belief, some of those who die instead of repeated return to this world, find eternal peace and are free from the reincarnation cycle. The principle of karma, one opens reincarnation. This principle holds that the consequences of people's actions are not lost, and we experience the karma of our actions in two stages, first in this lifetime and second in our next life in this world. Thus, followers of reincarnation believe that each individual faces the result of his actions in his return to this world and burns off negative karma people believe that this process occurs through a good person's rebirth into better life conditions such as a wealthy famiji and the rebirth of someone with negative karma into a lower life form an animal plant or an object or a more difficult and challenging human life such as a very poor family so that the pain and suffering will facilitate karma burnoff for this reason, believing in reincarnation on one hand causes false judgment about poor and less fortunate people, taking them as sinners in past lives and deserving hardship and misery. And on the other hand, favors the class system by accepting poverty and the superiority of wealthy and fortunate people in society. With humankind's constant rebirth and continuous resulting karma burnoff, one would expect evolution in the quality of human nature. alt Hoff to date human intelligence has increased and our technological advancement is unprecedented, negative consequences of such developments are also growing. For instance, people of the current era can damage the environment as much as all earlier people combined. Therefore, not on G do we not witness a reduction of the negative inheritance of one generation from the previous generation, but human life has also become more challenging and problematic than before. Therefore, it is difficult to accept that reincarnation has or ever will reduce negative karma. Furthermore, it is incorrect to think that the plan of creation considers humankind 
as an eternal convict condemned to a repeating cycle of life in this world to burn off the negative karma of our mistakes and wrongdoings. Each individual can experience transformation in this lifetime to achieve Kamal, and God is gracious and would not refuse us the opportunity for such transformation. If the method of making amends for mistakes is another life in this world, and humankind's life is thus spent without a higher purpose, the plan of creation would seem pointless. In addition, if we accept that humankind enters this world at birth, and after death a number of them are transformed into animals, plants, or objects, and a small number of them achieve eternal peace and freedom from the reincarnation cycle, the world's human population would decrease. Further, if we accept that humankind enters this world from a different place, we should also easily accept that a different place exists after death. It would be easy to then believe that we leave this world forever for another realm where life is also possible. With regard to the idea of humankind's rebirth in solid or object form, we must raise the question as to the proportional wallet of solid form to which each human being returns. For instance, how much stone does the death of an individual who is to be reborn as stone create? Does he return as a rock or a mountain? Can we even consider a unit of mesurement for stone? The theory of human rebirth in solid form fails to answer these questions, and so we cannot prove or accept this theory. A significant point to note here is that the distinctive factor between humankind and other beings in this world is humankind's selfful, which in essence is different from all else that exists in this world. The origin of all beings, including their software components, is logic and only humankind's self is a result of love and is of such essence. In this world, no vessel other than the human body can develop the capacities of self and prepare the ground for manifestation of our free will. The idea of reincarnation portrays for humankind a destiny of eternal pain or suffering that, even if one becomes free of it, proves a pointless and purposeless plan of creation and demonstrates that the designer has created the material world in vain with no objectives nor direction. However, one of the references often used to prove the idea of reincarnation is the reports of a different life by subjects in the state of hypnosis. These reports seem to describe clear memories of events and incidents of a life with different geographic allocation, date, race, language, education, job, and gender. It is important that post-experiment investigations for certain cases have validated the identity of the individual reported. Sometimes, the hypnotized person even speaks the language of the person while telling his life story. We argue, however, that these statements fact come from type B viruses who have possessed the mind of the hypnotized individual. They have lived the lives they describe and are not telling stories of the host's past lives. Through hypnosis, they communicate and reveal their existence. One sign of infection by non-organic viruses is the presence of such reports which end with eviction of the viruses, thus demonstrating that the statements do not represent the individual's past life memory. Exploiting non-organic beings Although people can obtain abilities such as seeing the future, reading one's thoughts and personality, imposing one's will on others, and prying into these areas by connecting to the negative network, it is also possible to gain such powers by associating with and taking advantage of non-organic beings. 